So as we arrive at the point in our service where in just a few moments we will rise for the Yiskor, I thought it fair to ask a question. The question is that what does our being here, our remembering our loved ones, our saying Yizkar on their behalf do, not for them, not for their souls, but for us. And in thinking about that question, I thought of the following answer. Aside from serving to remember our loved ones and their lives, Yiskor serves to teach us a fundamental lesson about life that our loved ones still teach us even from the graves. And that is that even though that they are gone, we are still here. We are still alive. The lesson, as difficult as it may be at times, is to teach us that life must go on. And if we have difficulty doing it for ourselves, then at least we should be doing it for our loved ones, because usually that is what they want. But the question is how? How do we go on after suffering a loss of a loved one, sometimes a very tragic loss, sometimes a loss that we have incredible difficulty accepting as being just? Mildred Horndorf is a former elementary school teacher from Des Moines, Iowa. And she supplemented her income by giving piano lessons. And she shares with us the following story about one of her former pupils. <clears throat> she writes, over the years I have had my share of what I call musically challenged pupils. One such student was Robbie. Robbie was 11 years old when his mother dropped him off for his first piano lesson. And although I prefer that students begin at a much earlier age, Robbie said to me that it had always been his mother's dream to hear him play the piano but couldn't afford for him to have lessons when he was younger. So she said, I decided to take him on as a student. <clears throat> well, from the beginning, I realized that this was a hopeless endeavor. As much as Robbie tried, he lacked the sense of tone, he lacked the sense of basic rhythm needed to excel. But he dutifully reviewed his scales and some very elementary pieces that I require all my students learn. And over the months, he tried and he tried. And while I listened and while I cringed, I tried to encourage him. And at the end of each weekly lesson, he'd always say, my mom's going to hear me play someday. But in my mind, I knew it was hopeless. He just didn't have any inborn ability to play the piano. And then one day, Robbie stopped coming to our lessons. I thought about calling him, but assumed because of his lack of ability that he had decided to perhaps pursue another avenue. I was also glad that he stopped coming. He was a bad advertisement for my teaching. Several weeks later, I mailed to the students' homes a flyer on the upcoming recital that the class was going to have. And to my surprise, Robbie asked me if he could be in the recital. And I told him that the recital was for current pupils only. And because he had dropped out, he really did not qualify. 
And he said, but my mother had been sick and, and unable to take him to piano lessons, but he was still practicing at home. Miss Horndorf, he says, I've just got to play, please. I don't know what led me to allow him to play in the recital, but I gave in. Well, the recital went off without a hitch. And then Robbie came up on stage, his clothes completely wrinkled, his hair looked like he'd run an egg beater through it. Why didn't he dress up like other students, I thought to myself. Why didn't his mother at least make him comb his hair, if nothing else, for this special night? Robbie pulled out the piano bench and began. I was shocked when he announced that he had chosen Mozart's Concerto No. 20 in C major. I was not prepared for what I was about to hear. His fingers were light on the keys. He went from pianissimo to fortissimo, from allegro to virtuoso. He suspended chords that Mozart demands were magnificent. Never had I heard Mozart played so well by people of his age. After six and a half minutes, he ended in a grand crescendo and everyone was on their feet with wild applause. Overcome and in tears, I ran up on the stage and put my arms around Robbie in joy. I've never heard you play like that, Robbie. How did you do it? And through the microphone, Robbie explained, well, Miss Hondorf, remember I told you that my mother was sick? Well, actually, she had cancer and passed away this morning. And well, she was born deaf. So tonight was the first time I knew she ever heard me play. And I wanted to make it that extra special. Now, that's a very true story. How did Robbie, how did Robbie manage to pull that off? How could he, in his grief, in his anguish over the loss of his mother, managed to play a difficult piano concerto in front of a crowd of people? And the answer to, to this question is the same as to the question that has struck everyone and anyone who has suffered the loss of a loved one. And that is, how can I possibly go on whether it is the loss of a parent, God forbid the loss of a spouse, or the unthinkable, God forbid the loss of a child. How can I go on living? It's an emotion and a feeling that hits us hard at the moment of loss. And sometimes these feelings of loss are so overwhelming that we just can't go on. But fortunately, other times, hopefully more frequently, just like Robbie, we somehow manage to muster up the strength and the courage to go on. We have to. We need to do it for ourselves. We need to do it for our loved ones who are still alive. And we need to do it for our loved ones who have gone. And that is because deep down inside, we realize that we must go on as long as we are still here. And even though we mourn, we must also continue to live. And that is what our tradition teaches us to do. That is what Yizka reminds us to do. Now, I'm sure Robbie wasn't Jewish, but if he was, then it's possible that he might have drawn some of his strength and courage from our liturgy. Because our liturgy attempts to answer the question, how do I go on for us? Liturgy, prayer, 
I've heard people say to me, Rabbi, why waste our time on prayer? God didn't hear my prayers in the first place and he took my loved one away. He took my child away. Why should I pray to him now when my child is gone? No amount of prayer is going to bring our loved ones back. But prayer does allow us to capture the strength we need to help us get through those tough times. It allows us to engage in a dialogue with a higher being, to maybe see things and understand things in a different light, and to maybe help us reach some kind of acceptance, an important enabling that allows our lives to continue. And prayer exists to help us out of depths of sorrow that we find ourselves in. I want to give you an example. Every morning, every morning we say Psalm 30, which we recite before the mourners' Kaddish. And in that psalm, we say the words, Ki rega ba'apo chayim birtsono ba'erev yolin bechi v'laboker rino. Which means, tears may linger for a night, but joy comes with the dawn. Joy? After all the pain that I've gone through? How could it all be possible? How can I pray those words every day? And I see mourners do it. They come after burying a loved one. They come to say Kaddish and they say those words. How can I pray these words which are not what I believe to be true? These are good questions and they're honest emotions. And so maybe we don't believe those words at first. Maybe in our grief, maybe in our sorrow, we can never believe that any joy will come back to our lives. But if we still believe in God, if we still believe in prayer, and if we still say Kaddish, then we will see that line over and over again in our heads. We will see that line actually come to life. And then one day, one day, those words might filter through. And maybe then the tears will only linger for a night, but not during the day. And maybe one day we will see the dawn. And then one day we will wake up and we will see that we have changed. We have found a way to survive. We have found a way to get through. Those words of Psalm 30 struck me as I thought of someone else who suffered a loss and also shared how to get through it. Again, someone not Jewish, but someone you might have heard of. There was once a young mother, her name was Rachel, who had a daughter named Miriam. Miriam was the light of Rachel's life. She loved her more than anything else in this world. But then, Miriam was just three years old when she was diagnosed with a rare and aggressive form of cancer. Rachel was devastated. She spent all her time and energy taking care of Miriam, didn't leave her bedside. She did everything she could to make her daughter's last days as comfortable as possible. She held Miriam's hand through every painful treatment, never leaving her side. And as Miriam's condition worsened, Rachel refused to give up hope. She continued praying for a miracle. Even as the doctors told her they tried to let her down so carefully, they told her that there was nothing more that they could do. Rachel knew her, her daughter's time was running out, but she refused to let go. And finally, the day came. The day came when Miriam's suffering came to an end. Rachel was inconsolable. She had lost 
the most important person in her life. And she felt like a part of her had died along with her daughter. But even in the midst of her own grief, Rachel thought of others. She knew, she knew that other families were going through the same thing that she had and she wanted to help them. Rachel started a foundation in Miriam's memory, providing support and comfort to families who were dealing with childhood cancer. She spent countless hours counseling parents, visiting the sick, going to the, the children's hospitals, and organizing fundraising events to support research into finding a cure. Rachel never forgot the pain. She never forgot the heartache that she went through. But she chose to, to, to direct her pain, to use her pain to help others. She turned her tragedy into a source of hope for those who needed it most. My friends, as we remember our loved ones today, let us be inspired by Rachel's selflessness and her devotion. Let us honor the memory of our loved ones by giving back to our communities, by helping others in need and spreading love and compassion wherever we go. That is our prayer. That is Psalm 30. And that is our Yisker too. And this is why Yisker is so powerful. Because it teaches us that as long as we are still alive, as long as we are still here, as long as we still have time left, we can never, ever give up. Not only because that's what our loved ones would have wanted for us, but because we never know, never know what still awaits us in this life if we don't give up. And as Jews especially given our history, we must go on living. And if you don't believe me, maybe this story will convince you that no matter what, we must go on living. It's a story about Shlomo and Maurice who sat next to each other on an El Al flight from New York to Tel Aviv right before the holidays. And as the sun rose, it's very very typical on El Hal flights to Israel, people start jumping up to make a minion. Have you seen that, everybody? And if, they, and if they don't have a minion, they walk down the aisle and say, you're Jewish, come on, make a minion. And the minion formed in the back of the plane. Shlomo immediately got out of his seat and retrieved his tefillin from the overhead compartment and went to the back to Darwin. And when he returned to his seat, he asked Maurice if he would like to borrow his tefillin. <laughs> Maurice looked at him. He glowered at Shlomo and in an angry voice replied, I have nothing to do with him. I don't want your or anyone else's to fill in. Pointing below, he continued that when they, when they took my youngest son, when they told me to go right and they shoved him left, from that day on, I had no use for to fill in or anything to do with God. Can I ask you something, Shlomo asked? If you are so angry with God, why are you going to Israel? What do you mean? He asked. Why am I going to Israel? Maurice replied. I am angry at God, but I am not angry at his people. I love the Jewish people, and I want to spend time with them, especially at this time of the year, the holiday season. Upon landing in Israel, the two, man, the two men went their separate ways, never running into each other. But on Yom Kippur, during the break before Yiskor, Shlomo was walking towards a park next to the synagogue where he prayed at. And when he reached the park, Shlomo saw Maurice sitting on a bench by the beach there, eating a sandwich. Shlomo approached Maurice and said, Listen, I know that you're angry with God and I know you want having to, nothing to do with him. But what about your son? What did your son do that you refuse even to recite a prayer in his memory? Don't you think your son's worthy of that? 
And after a few minutes of uncomfortable silence, Maurice spoke up. He said, maybe you're right. While it's true that I said goodbye to him at Auschwitz, I never said goodbye to my son. I never had that chance. Maybe it's time to say a prayer in his memory. And turning to Shlomo with tears in his eyes, Maurice asked, can I go with you? And clutching each other's hands, they walked back to shore. After reciting Yiskor, the two men joined the line of people waiting for their turn to have the cantor recite an El Mali Rachamim in memory of their loved ones. Please recite the El Mali Rachamim for my son, who I last saw at Auschwitz. Morris quietly asked the Chazan. The cantor began to chant the prayer, but then suddenly he stopped in the middle. Tell me, he asked, what was your son's name? He said, Semach Yankel Ben Moshe. The cantor fell to his knees and he said, Tatele, Tatele, I've been waiting for you for so long. He thought that his father was dead, and the father thought that his son was dead. Let us remember the words that Yisko comes to teach us. As long as we are still alive, as long as we still have time left in this world, we must never, ever, ever give up. Because we never know what still awaits us in this life if we don't. I'd like to conclude with the words of Joe Biden when he said, there will come a day, I promise you, when the thought of your son or daughter or your husband or wife brings a smile to your lips before it brings a tear to your eye. It will happen. My prayer for you is that day will come sooner or later. But the only thing I have more experience than you is in this, and I'm telling you, it will come. You all know the history of what Biden went through. And that is the prayer for our, our loved ones ascending down to us from heaven today as we recite this year's score. And hopefully, as we do, that smile comes to our lips before the tears fall from our eyes. And may the souls of all those who we remember here today be remembered for a blessing. And may we be privileged to keep their memories alive for many years to come. As a footnote to this sermon, a painful footnote, the young man, Robbie, that I told you of in the story, was killed in the bombing of the Alfred P. Murray Federal Building in Oklahoma City in April of 1995. May their souls be bound up in the bond of life eternal. Amen. Please rise for the Yiscon.